2025 is going to be an exciting year because we have the full definition of the vehicle. We're moving on. We will have qualification engines in Stennis going through testing. That's going to qualify our flight design and unlock the ability to go produce flight engines at rate. We'll have the primary structure completed for parts of our rocket. We'll begin integrating on what's often called the secondary assemblies, avionics, fluids, propulsion systems. We will see the entire factory, every single work center become alive. We will see hardware flow from one work center to the other. We'll lean on our digital systems, our enterprise systems. This is truly the first year we're gonna have a fully functioning factory for Terranar. And on the manufacturing side, the manufacturing teams have been hard at work, you know, getting this, this production facility operational. And also, in addition to that, there's a lot of infrastructure that's being put in to turn on our machine shop in a higher capacity to produce more hardware. Not only are we building out each work center, we're building out the capability of each work center and the capacity analysis of how these work centers optimize for themselves and flow into each and every other work center. This is a foundational element of a mature production system. The entire process starts with raw material arriving on the dock. We then mill out the panels ourselves, removing mass where we can to both optimize for strength and optimize for mass. We go through a rolling process where we take these panels and bring them as close to cylindrical geometry as we can. It doesn't have to be perfect because the friction stir welders that we've designed have the ability through the tooling and through different clamping methods to bring approximately cylindrical barrel sections into the correct tolerances where then we can proceed through the friction stir welding operation. We start vertical, we make one barrel, then as we have barrels stacked up, we can go through a circumferential welding process where we complete a much longer cylinder than we would be able to complete with a pure vertical welding method. From there, we're able to add the end caps for domes also through a friction stir welding process, and that completes the tank for the primary structure. But a lot of the way this is built for our panels, the way we have to incorporate our design features, the weld parameters that matter for the alloys that we're using, this is all customization that is not available off the shelf. 2026 is bringing it all together, all elements of the vehicle. The second half of a development campaign, essentially between the critical design review that we just passed in December and first flight is one of my favorite parts of the entire industry. Some of the things that I look forward to the most are completing our primary structures testing. Uh, these are some of the most complicated tests we'll ever run with millions of pounds on the rocket at dozens of PSI of pressure, really pushing the limits of what structures can do. Uh, we'll learn a lot from those before we go to stage testing. Stage testing, in my mind, is really where the rubber hits the road for the program. It's the first time that every piece of the program is united together across hardware, software, avionics, uh, propulsion, structures, mechanisms, and the infrastructure teams. So that's really, in a sense, a dress rehearsal before our launch where we can see the entire system and all of our teams come together. And I think that's personally my favorite part. And then from there, there's nothing like getting into a launch campaign. Uh, getting the whole system together and again, uniting the teams, the focus that you have in that final phase of the program is, is a feeling that I, I always look to uh, find in my career and I'm really excited to get there this time. The first steps after our first launch have already begun. We're already working on the second flight worth of hardware in some cases. Over 2025 and 2026, we'll have multiple ship sets of Terranar hardware in development so that we can follow up our first launch as quickly as possible with the second launch, third flight, fourth flight, and beyond. Looking ahead to our long-term ramp rate, you know, you realize that manufacturing and scaling of hardware production is only half of the equation. The other half of the equation really is tied to how rapid reusable this vehicle is. Reusability is one of the top goals of Terranar, even in the early days. From the very first sketches of Terran R that I did with a few folks, we've always been focused on getting the first flight fast, but making sure the architecture is extremely sound to make the vehicle reusable as fast as possible. One of the fundamental requirements of any reusable booster system is the capability to complete entry, descent, and landing, which in the industry we call EDL. And there are three main things any system needs to do to get there. First, it has to slow down from an extremely high velocity after the end of the first stage burn percent, somewhere around four or 5,000 miles an hour. 
It then needs to survive the physical environment of entering the atmosphere and slowing down from that high speed, which creates extreme levels of heating, thus temperature and vibration on every system of the rocket. And it needs to slow down and accurately hit the landing location, which in our case is a barge floating in the Atlantic Ocean. The vehicle architecture is set up in a way where it's got reusability in mind right out of the gate. There are a lot of ways that this manifests. I think the first one in my mind as a rocket engineer is vehicle performance. We allocate a lot of rocket performance towards recoverability and reusability. I think the other area is that our designs out of the gate are kind of implementing those features right away. You know, our grid fins, for example, are there right away. Our landing legs are right away. And we're already thinking about how this vehicle operationally is going to perform for, for recoverability. Because the vision for Terranar has always involved reusability, we've invested a lot of resources in understanding reusability and developing the booster architecture to allow reuse in the early days. One of the areas that is really essential to entry descent landing success is aerodynamics. So we completed a full test campaign for both the aft end of the rocket, which is a very sensitive area in terms of loads and the heating, as well as a test to understand our grid fin control system years in advance of our first flight. So our approach to realizing the full potential of Terran R involves a block upgrade strategy. This essentially means that we'll stage different changes of the vehicle and the ground systems over time to finally get to the full potential later on. And this is critical to the overall success of Terran R because it allows for learning in the early phases of the program while we can still serve customers without requiring us to get every single thing perfect. The vehicle iteration is a really important part of our development path. Our development path doesn't stop at the block one vehicle. We're already thinking about block two and block three and beyond and what that vehicle looks like. But you have to be very, very careful when you're looking at these, these upgrade paths because if you make your first block too ambitious, too high performing, you're less likely to field it in a reasonable amount of time. What we've chosen here to do is just make the targets just a little bit easier on our team and shoot for, let's say, 20 tons, metric tons to low Earth orbit for our Block 1 vehicle and aiming to work through our reusability and recovery plans in our operations and our, in our testing for the first block. In Block 1, our, our goals are very simple. We need to get our customers to orbit safely and we need to recover boosters. And the focus there is really on making relativity into a new launch company in the market and starting to learn about reusability and operations to get ready for future parts of the program. We're gonna to try to soft land the first stage for the first mission in the ocean. I think coming out of the Block 1 campaign, we'll want to have recovered and fully inspected and potentially retested a first stage that we've recovered, but we're really not leaning on true reusability for the first block of the vehicle. The first block of the vehicle, I really view as more of a engineering stepping stone to get to the full, full reusability of the first stage. Block 2 builds upon the lessons we learned in Block 1, uh, specifically around collecting flight data for ascent to expand our mission capability to serve different parts of the, the customer marketplace, and also to move into reuse, not just entry, descent, landing of our booster stage. So that's really a place where we go from learning to execution and beginning to refine the system overall. From Block 2, we know that there's still potential in our architecture to fly higher performing missions and expand our mission set, and we'll get into that in Block 3. Similarly, as we get into reusability, not just entry to send landing in Block 2, we'll take those lessons to get to the highest cadence possible for the overall system in Block 3, where we're talking about 50 or even 100 flights a year. Even though Block 1 might start with relatively humble goals looking at the overall industry of getting to orbit and getting to reusability, the vehicle architecture has been developed in a way where the full potential will allow us to do things that no one has ever done.